Tenerness. Hello, folks. You have tuned in to another episode of Mel and Kel. We have some amazing women on this show today. And of course, one of those women uh, is my co host today, uh, my wife, Kelly Jenner. Very good husband. <laughs> That's why I wore my phenomenal woman shirt because of the phenomenal women we're going to be talking to today. Simone Missick and Yvette Nicole Brown, young storytellers. Hey, y'all. I can wave, wave, wave. Hey, Errol. I was, oh, I waved too. <laughs> um, yeah. So while we wait for them to join, if my husband would like to start over with his introduction, because no one was here and no one heard that. Okay. You have, guys have tuned in to another episode of Mel and Kel. We thank you for tuning in. We have some amazing women coming through. Simone Mystic, as well as Yvette Nicole Brown. You guys are in for a treat today. Waiting for Simone, waiting for Simone. <laughs> hey, Simone. Hey, guys. What's going on? You know, just breaking lamps. <laughs> breaking lamps. I was like, oh, no, this isn't going to work. And now I'm just going to adjust, adjust this, uh, this tripod so that I can see you guys. Hey, How's Yvette. I saw Yvette. Came on. So why, so while Simone is getting ready, we're going to just give her a quick, uh, well, well uh, to do introduction. Um, you may have known this woman as Detective um, Misty Knight on Luke Cage, as well as Iron Fist, The Defenders. Um, and you get to watch her right now on CBS as the phenomenal soul sister, Judge Lola Carmichael. Give it up once again for Simone Misty in the building. <laughs> Hey, y'all. Hey, Simone, how you doing? I'm good. Yeah? Pretty good. Yeah. Today's mm -hmm. been a good day. It's been a good week. Every day you wake up healthy, you know, can't complain. Mm -hmm. It's been a good day. Yeah. All right, Yvette. You understand what I'm saying? That that pickup, that season two pickup, okay? <laughs> Just took I just took my boxing gloves off because I was like, because what we not gonna do <laughs> is not give this a second season and a third and a fourth and a fifth until mm -hmm. Simone says I'm done. You better be on there. That's when it's on. That's when you need to be playing with me. I need you to be there next season. With listen, fun. Listen, all in God's time. Busy. You busy. You just off doing movies <laughs> everywhere I turn on every channel I got Kelly working. Let me tell you something. The the beauty, the beauty in all that's happening for me right now is that it's happening right now. Two of those films were shot in 2018, two I years remember. ago. You I understand remember. what I'm saying? It makes I it remember. seem like all snap. <laughs> like Nisi, hey Nisi. <laughs> Okay. I love it though. I love it. That's how that's how his timing works. Yeah. Like, Why does he come out? Right. And, so yeah. Simone, you have a lot of firsts to add to your titles. I, I hear word around the street is you are the first African American uh, lead fe uh, female to lead a show on CBS, and you're also um, part of the first show to ever um, do a virtual episode. Um, I believe that that was really good. So talk talk about that. How did you feel? shooting a virtual episode, and how did that all come about? So uh, our show creator and our producers called us all up on Zoom, and we just thought it was just like, hey, we're checking in on everybody, make sure everybody has toilet paper and everything that they need. And, you know, how's everybody faring in this pandemic? And about 15 minutes into the conversation, they're like, yeah, so we've come up with this idea for this uh, Zoom episode. And which y'all think? And they start reading their treatment, basically. And we were all like, yes, 
this sounds great. Let's do this. And within about seven days, we were shooting. They wrote the script. CBS approved it. We started doing at home tech scouts and location scouts. They were sending us equipment, sanitized to make sure that everything was clean. Kelly, I know you know <laughs> the level of anxiety that could pop up on that. Like, you show it's clean, but it's clean. Right. clean. And who cleaned it? We'll talk, so, we'll talk about the straw incident um, later. <laughs> <laughs> Here, I got that for you. No, 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 it's okay. No, no, no. <laughs> we can talk about this trust. <laughs> so, um, once everything got started, it was it was tough. It was a lot of work. It was every actor doing twelve different jobs. It wasn't just let me show up at my call time and. Somebody will do my hair, my makeup, give me my props, my wardrobe. Mm -hmm. I'll walk into a set. It's already set. It's already lit. It's already ready. It was like we actors had to do every single job ourselves. Yeah. So it was 13 different departments that we had to manage because uh, we counted, including crafty. And it would be mm -hmm. like, okay, everybody, you're going to go on like a 30-minute lunch, and then we'll see you back. And you're like, Woo! And you're exhausted. And then you remember, you got to make your own food. Mm -hmm. And you still have to go set up the next shot for when that 30 minutes is up. So you really didn't have a break. It was like eating peanut butter jelly sandwiches and like moving furniture because you're moving around in your own house. And a yeah. lot of the spaces that we used, they weren't the way that they're normally set up. Like I had my dining room to look like an office. That's not, you know. So. Mm -hmm. It was it was tough, but at the same time, it was rewarding. And now being able to see like the fruits of everybody's labor, not just the actors, but our crew. We had about a third of our normal crew working in a virtual video village behind the scenes, like mm -hmm. making sure that everything, you know, was on point, looked the way it needed to look. They edited it until about one in the morning that Monday before it aired. So wow. they didn't, you know, finish the job until they knew that it was done. And I'm just really proud of what we were able to accomplish. Congratulations. Before we get into your, your backstory, I wanted to bring up um, a situation <laughs> that happened because um, you fell in love with the project called Jen. You uh, started in as Jade and you also co uh, executive produced it, but you also made a phone call in that process Talk to the people about that process that happened, what made you fall in love with the film, and um, the importance of keeping uh, relationships like you and Kelly have. Uh, so I read the script. First of all, that script was brought to me by my husband, who had already been attached to it. Um, Nigel Mumin, the director, you know, had already been talking to him, and right, can we clap her up? Mm -hmm. um, writer, director, first of all. And he had already been in talks with her and he dropped my name. He was like, I think Simone would be great for this. And she was like, do you think she'd be interested? And that was the beginning of that relationship. I read the script. I loved it. I wanted to immediately come on as a, as a producer. And my reasoning behind that wasn't because I didn't think that they were capable. Cause I mean, you know, this was their baby. Um, and what I wanted was to make sure that I was able to help the project as much as I could. And for me, that's always bringing amazing actors. And I, you know, read that script and I was like, Kelly, like Kelly Jenrette. I had already <laughs> worked with Kelly on a play and was just blown away by her talent, but had seen Kelly for years before that through various like TV shows and commercials like somebody who can capture your attention in a commercial you're like oh no this is a talent <laughs> and so kelly and i had met when i was auditioning for the abc diversity workshop which i want to interrupt you because simone came in i was a reader for the abc diversity showcase simone came in and she we read and i was like oh no this She's in the wrong place. I think she, she's supposed to be on set somewhere. Why is she? Why is she? When you left, I looked over to the exec and I said, "Oh yeah, she did. She did. Yeah, killed it. 
killed it. Okay. And I appreciate you because it was your support. Like I remember <laughs> finding out that we have mutual friends. Mm -hmm. I was like, uh, girlfriend, can mm -hmm. you? and you were just so loving and so giving as you always are. And you know, that's the way that I am as an actor. Like I'm, uh, I've met some of my closest friends at auditions. Mm -hmm. Like just, you know, there, cause to me, there is no sense of like competition and it's me or you, or if I get this job, I got to get it cause you didn't get it. It's like, God's got all the blessings out there for everybody to get, to grab. And you might be a blessing as a friend. And so once I met you, worked with you, I was like, oh no, you're, you're stuck with me. And then when Jen came around, I recommended, you know, Kelly to Nigella, but Kelly came in and got that job. Like <laughs> nobody was like, oh, cause Simone said like, no, Kelly's a phenomenal actress. So she came Thanks. in, she, you know, blew everybody's socks off <laughs> as usual. And I think, you know, just gave our project so much just weight to it, like gave it some really grounded, beautiful, real. I mean, it was, it, you know, if you haven't seen Jen, go on <laughs> iTunes, Amazon, probably, like anywhere that you can rent a film and watch that yeah. film. Yeah, it's a good film. Kelly and I and Dorian mm -hmm. and Zoe Renee and, and Kelvin, who's Kelvin. like, <laughs> cool. I saw Kelvin here. like, Cool. I know. I said, "Oh, you a grown man?" I saw a peach, a picture of him, and I was like, "What? What happened?" Yeah, Kevin is playing around <laughs> in his Go. Gucci ads. So yeah, <laughs> so yeah, that was and it you, to me, you know, it's important. I want to produce projects. I'm in talks to produce another film, and every time that I you know, become a part of something or I read something, if I have the power, like if someone says to me, would you be interested in executive producing? It's only because I want to bring other quality actors to a project. And, it, and you know, a lot of it comes from watching what Dorian does. Like when Dorian becomes a part of an indie film, when you think about indie films, you're not making a lot of money. It's mm -hmm. going to be a labor of love. You're devoting, you know, your time to a project because you believe in it and you believe in the script. And sometimes with indie projects, people aren't as, you know, ready to jump on board because they might think, oh, you know, I don't know the director or I'm not sure what the cast is going to shape up to be. So if you have the power to bring other great actors around and, and surround, you know, yourself with people who you know are going to help the project, that's, you know, that's, that's, the point. Absolutely. I'm going to put my producer hat on and I'm going to say, when are you and Kelly going to produce and start an, a project together? Mm. Oh, funny, gonna... funny, funny you should ask. <laughs> Kelly. Well, that a wedding. yes. Starring, because that, that, that was, we're going to talk about that. You keep going. Actually, I, um, so I will, God, impressed it upon my heart through the help of others. It was initiated by Jeff Stetson, who was the writer of The mm -hmm. Meeting. It was an imagined meeting between Martin Luther King and Malcolm X. And I met Jeff Stetson and I was like, Jeff, you know, this was amazing. I would love to see a conversation between Betty and Coretta. And he was kind of like... Mm -hmm. And then someone behind me heard me say that, and they were like, well, you should write it. And I was like, mm -hmm. <laughs> and then I started, I, I, Kimberly A. Bear, the founder of Black Rebirth Collective, I'm also a founding member, um, along with Erica Tazzle, I shared with them, you know, this thing that was floating around in my mind, and they were like, great. So at our, at our next meeting, um, you can present what you've written. And I was like, but I, what do you talk, what do you mean? And I was like, okay, fine. So it's a piece about Betty and Coretta. And I, as I was like praying, like, okay, who, who, who is my dream cast? And Simone Missick popped in my head. And when I tell you, look, Simone and I are friends and not like, oh, hey, hey, hey but like, 
like for real, for real friends. But there was still nervousness in me to reach out to my friend to ask her if she would be interested in playing Coretta. But when I did, I'm not going to cry. This is not what we're doing here today. <laughs> bring them. Bring them. No. When I, when I, when I finally um, submitted to the courage that is inside of me and text her like, so hope everything's going well. Um, do you think you'll be around? Where will you be in September? And she was like, I think I'll be in LA. What's going on? And I was like, well, God has put it on my heart to write a play um, about Betty and Coretta. And when I was asked who my dream cast would be, my dream Coretta, I said, Simone. So then she took a couple of a moments. I, I, I don't know if it I was, was. I was typing. But, but but before you responded, I want to say it was almost half an hour. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was like, oh, no. <laughs> it's fine. I don't know. Okay, well, just who so else? Just clear, my cell phone doesn't work. I, I was like, out. no, she's not responding. She's not. And then she, you responded back, and you were like, no, I let wanted. Her, let her tell. Okay, yes. Then you, tell, you, you take it from here. So... No, because your memory is probably <laughs> okay, far than mine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so then I finally get a response back that said I wanted to uh, take my time in responding, and she sent over a link. And I thought it was going to be, um, you know, like a, a motivational, like, you know, continue to follow your dreams. <laughs> God's got you. And I was like. The telling version of the story is so much better than <laughs> when I would have finished this. So I was like, okay, I click on the link and I'm like, oh, okay, it's an interview that um, Simone is doing. Again, thinking like she's going to be talking about just pursuing your dreams and when you're afraid, just do it anyway. So <laughs> then I was like, just watching it and the person asked her about, you know, her dream role and who she really wanted to portray. See, goosebumps. And um, she said, oh Coretta. God, Coretta Scott King and immediately Melvin was sitting on the steps. I was sitting on the sofa and immediately when you said that, I just put my hand over my face and I started crying because it was such a beautiful confirmation of when you do what God has told you to do, he will always provide. The provision will always be there. And she responded back, so the answer is, of course, yes. Of course. And so, you know, then everything happened. <laughs> we don't know when it's going to happen. I'm pretty sure it's not going to happen in September. In September, I'm gonna put I'm gonna put some coins on that, like a few yeah. nickels to say, probably not. But probably not. It's yeah. Be in his timing. Yeah, absolutely. It will be in his timing, and it will be exactly what it's supposed to be. So, and that's just a testament. Um, to how beautiful you are, Simone. You know, I, I love that you are still touchable. You know, you're still reachable. You are, you're, you're amazing. Y'all, I called Simone and left her a message. I'm not gonna go into the details of this message after that first episode of All Right. Everybody tell these messages are great. <laughs> just so you know, like... You know how they have those celebrity things where you could call people up and like leave them a message? You need to pick up that side gig because you will be changing people's lives <laughs> with messages. They're like, oh, yeah, I, I was, I was so moved when I tell you, like, I watched the episode and then I went back and watched it again, and I was just, I, all I kept saying was, my God, like. You were just so effortless. Your talent is, oh, my friend, you are, hmm. Well, yeah. you, Emmy nominated, <laughs> that means a lot, okay? <laughs> just putting that out there. Let's not forget. Emmy nominated. Mm -hmm. Kelly Jr. Yeah. Emmy nominated Melvin Jackson Jr. Hello, yes. somebody. Yes. Listen, God is good, but listen, we, we're talking about you right now, so listen. We are. You have played some amazing and iconic roles, and as a black woman, you are representing African-American women to the fullest, um, and I think it's something that, that is a testament to your will, to your spirit, 
to who you are. Like everybody just don't get these roles that you get. They either get the sister girl, the bougie girl, or the 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 hooker around the street. But like you have had the classiest roles in the past couple of years on TV, and I want to applaud you. But I want you to explain people that journey to get there. That it just didn't happen overnight. But your journey from Detroit to my to my hometown where you went to Howard University. Like how you got to where you are right now. So I'm going to try to do this story in <laughs> three minutes or less. Uh, you know, I grew up in Detroit. Very great, you know, upbringing. Working class family. Tight knit family. Um, played sports, played the violin, did not tell anybody I wanted to be an actor. Didn't tell anybody that, that was my, my desire, my dream, my goal. Even though my family was super supportive in everything that I did, I knew that that was the one thing that I wanted more than anything. And at the time I wasn't a Christian, I wasn't raised a Christian. So it wasn't like the idea of believing in prayer and like setting a goal, you know, obviously goal setting, but not with the idea that God has put you on this planet in order to do something. So if it's on your heart, then that's meant for you. I wasn't in that place yet. And so, you know, graduated high school, decided to go to Howard, which is my dad's alma mater, my grandmother, my aunt, my mm. dad's from DC. So I was like, okay. oh, you know, <laughs> DC is cool. I've been going there my whole life. But when I stepped on Howard's campus, I was like, oh no, this is it. <laughs> this is where I'm going. Um, and I was there majoring in English, still too afraid to pursue acting, took an acting for non-majors course that a girlfriend from Detroit randomly was like, Simone, you should, you know, take this class. I'm taking it. I love it. It wasn't also like, because you could be an actor. It was just, this is a fun elective course. I took the class, immediately knew that this was something I wanted to do with the rest of my life. And the, the teacher encouraged me. It wasn't like, oh, yeah, okay, little weirdo. Like, she believed in me. She ended up being a mentor. Um, and I asked her, you know, should I major? Should I switch my major? Should I stay a year? Should I double major? She was like, just take as many classes as you can. So by the time I graduated, everybody in the School of Fine Arts thought that I was an acting major. They were like, wait, you're not, you know, walking across the stage with us. Like, what do you mean? <laughs> That's we were in the, so, I, you know, exhausted every class that I could take there, decided to study abroad at uh, the British American Drama Academy post-graduation, had an amazing experience there, moved back home to Detroit and started saving up. I knew that I wanted to pursue acting, didn't know what the best path would be, where I should go, what I should do. And so I started doing theater in Detroit, like regional theater and community theater and a bunch of just like small things to stay busy. And I was working and waiting tables and I called up my professor and she was like, I said, you know, what should I do? Should I go to grad school? Should I move? She was like, don't go to grad school. <laughs> and to this day, I need to ask her why she said that. But regardless, <laughs> she was like, don't go to grad school. And I said, okay, so where should I go? Should I go to New York, LA, Chicago? Here I am asking someone to tell me how to pursue my dream. Hmm. She's like, well, where do you want to go? Like, what, what city do you want to be in? And I had spent a lot of time in New York during undergrad. I was like, that's not really my speed. I think California, I spent some time in LA. I really liked it out there. Let's do LA. So I saved up my money, moved out to LA in 2005. And for the next five years, it was a lot of just growing up. It was a lot of bumping around. It was a lot of like, for me, spiritual, you know, highs and lows and growth and, and stunting of growth. It was like, when I moved out there, I was a Christian, newly born again. I would gotten born again in 2003. So I was like, God's got this. Like, I got this. I'm going to be famous <laughs> in five years. Huh. And then, you know, being young happened. Like I had to grow up. I was 23 when I moved here. And so it was like, I'm going out. I'm hanging out. I'm staying up late. I'm not going to fellowship on Sunday morning because I'm like hung over. I'm not, you know, I'm definitely not believing for the kind of success that I did when I first landed. And what was interesting was when I first got here, you know, nobody told me the path to take. Nobody was like, oh, you know, this is what you should do. 
everyone who I knew was like, join SAG. Like no one had, <laughs> and, and this was like in Detroit. They were like, you should join SAG before you move. I'm like, how do you join SAG <laughs> in Detroit? Oh, it wasn't that easy. Shooting anything, nothing. So uh, when I moved out, I knew it was going to be just me figuring it out. Um, I started working at the Cheesecake Factory at the Grove, where I met a lot of amazing people, people who are still my friends to this day. Um, and, you know, at the time, it was like, oh, no, God, God's got this. First of all, y'all mad about your tips? I'm getting 20% on every check. Second of all, y'all, you know, think I'm not going to go out and be somebody. I'm about to be somebody. And I started doing background work. And I did three jobs. On all of those jobs, everything that was supposed to be just like basic, it got, it was bigger. Like I was just supposed to be a person walking in the background. They were like, hey, you, we want you to be at the front. And we want you to like, you know, be the featured extra. And I was like, oh. And there was a part of me deep down that knew that whatever I wanted, if I believed big enough, God was going to make it happen. Here I was getting blessed on my job financially. Here I was going and doing background work where you're supposed to be treated like a prop, which I was, but there was still a level of favor that I could feel. And this is the first time I've said this. I got afraid by that. I got scared by that. Like the, mm -hmm. the realization of how much power we all have as we believe was terrifying. And then I spent five years trying to unlearn that fear. Five years of trying to get back on track spiritually. Mm. I went from doing well financially at work to hating my job because I wasn't making any money. The same job that I, you know, came in and was doing well at. I was like, I got to get out of here. Uh, and then when it came to acting, I spent a lot of time just bumping around, trying to figure out what the way to do it. Is it going to be the right class? Is it going to be the right casting director workshop? Is it going to be the right, you know, uh, web series that I shoot is it going to be the right play that I put on and write is it what is it going to be and it wasn't until I met my husband Dorian in 2010 that things started to click in again and part of it was because I became focused on helping him spiritually and helping mm. him with his career um and not like I'm helping him like oh let me show you how to act but i remember when we met he was going through pilot season and spiritually he was a christian but my believing when it came to other people strong so he's like man i got you know i got a test for this i was like oh you're gonna get it let's pray you need some scriptures what you need i'll write them down i'll put it on a post-it send it like you need a bag lunch i'll put the post-it in the bag lunch like <laughs> it was you know there was no doubt in, in for me with him and yet for myself I didn't have that and vice versa like that's one of those things where you know when someone brings you a helpmate it's it, that's the person who's supposed to help you mm -hmm. listen to God pray to get mm -hmm. things that you need to get in order to live the life that you're supposed to lead and he and I can both believe huge things for each other and sometimes not always see the same opportunities for ourselves. And so that was the beginning of everything just kind of falling in line. He was like, quit your server job because you're too tired to be awake for auditions. And at the time we were just engaged. We weren't living together because I didn't believe in that and neither did he. Uh, but we were engaged and he was like, I got you. And I was like, because I grew up. My mama was, and they were like, whatever you need, you're going to work for it. You can not mm. on anybody for anything. And he's like, but you're going to be my wife. And I'm like, yeah, but not yet. <laughs> so <laughs> It's not today. It, we ain't worked that out yet. Mm -hmm. um, and, but I ended up quitting my job. I booked three commercials. And I was like, well, at least I'm going to be financially stable. I booked three commercials. I'll be able to take this leap. <laughs> None of those commercials ran. Not a single. <laughs> wow. Not a one. But and you got one on on Monday nights uh, at nine p.m. <laughs> <laughs> every 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 day. You, know, you got a blue on the bus. You're the now, bus stop. Now, right yeah. um, in a row. But during that time, like during the time from when we met, 
and got yes. married. And then it was it was five years <clears throat> between when we met and when I booked Luke Cage. And it was five years of him telling me, you're so close. You're right there. You're talented. You're going to make it. If you're doing in these auditions what you're doing when we're rehearsing them in the living room, you're, you know, it's just a matter of time. It's just one yes. All you need is one yes. Mm -hmm. But even during that time, spiritually, I was like, I don't know, though. Like, God, is this really what you want me to do? Mm -hmm. And I would pray these desperate prayers. I was like, God, please, just, if this is not what you want from me, just take it away. Just take it away so that I could just go off and do whatever it is you want me to do. And every single time, God would give me a job. Now, it wouldn't be the job. <laughs> it wouldn't be like, oh, she didn't book the, you know. Yeah. No, it would be a commercial or a short film or a play or an industrial. It would never be the thing that I thought I'd move to LA to get. It would just be a job. And I felt like I was like, so just shut up. Just like sit over there. Just. <laughs> and so I remember I looked up and it was, I think, 2019. And I was depressed. Like, I remember waking up one day and going to my kitchen and being like, I'm not happy. And so I realized that I needed to give. And I was like, if I'm not happy, it's because I'm not giving. I'm looking for somebody to give me something. Mm. So me and my girlfriends, we, not 2019, I'm sorry, 2014. Me and my girlfriend started a Bible study. We were all actors, we were all Christians. And I was like, we should just start reading a book, you know, and talking about it every week. And, you know, maybe this will help. We were all at various stages in our careers, various stages in, you know, where we were feeling about ourselves spiritually. And so we just all jumped in that, like no questions asked. And the first book we read was The Purpose Driven Life by Rick Warren. And reading that book, I was like, oh, okay, now I know I'm supposed to be an actor. <clears throat> so I can stop wasting my time asking God, am I supposed to be an actor? Mm -hmm. And I can just start focusing on believing and doing the work that I have to do to get there. And within a year, I got an audition for Luke Cage. At this point, I had three co-stars to my resume, uh, an indie feature film, an indie short film that I got cut out of, but that credit is still on my IMDb because they refuse <laughs> to let me go on that. And I had done theater and I'd done a ton of commercials, but I had not done any guest star, no recurring, no series, nothing. Mm -hmm. No tests. I had never tested for anything. And I booked this show. And that was 10 years almost to the day of me moving to LA. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there were so many things that happened along the way. I mean, I did the NBC Diversity Showcase, which is why I couldn't do the NBC Diversity Showcase. Right. And which I was like, don't be like that, y'all. <laughs> I was trying to double dip. Uh, and that's where I met an amazing person named Shannon Sylvain at the time. Mm -hmm. And Shannon became this, you know, amazing champion for me and mm -hmm. a tremendous friend, but a, a wealth of information and like encouragement and positivity. And during that diversity showcase, I met my lawyer, then I met my manager. That, and so I now had a team that believed in me. And then eventually I got a new agent that believed in me. And... <laughs> That audition process, I've told this story before, but I was opening up a play at the Fountain Theater. I was sick as a dog. I had gotten sick over the weekend of opening and I got this audition and I went in and just said, God, just give me 10 minutes. Just give me 10 minutes where my nose doesn't run. I don't lose my voice. I'm not coughing all over the place. That's all I need. Went in had an amazing audition, but I, you know, I say that now that it was amazing at the time. Mm -hmm. They were like, okay, thank you. This was great. I think, I think that's all we need. Okay, great. Have a good day. Mm -hmm. Don't and you love then, that? <laughs> it's the best. Uh, and then, you know, a week later, my life changed. My life, you know, completely changed for the better. My career changed. So that's that. That's the 10-year overnight success. 
right like people like to say you know mm -hmm. and it has been a series of you know incremental highs and lows you know luke cage got canceled and the moment that happened i was like all right what are we doing next there was no <clears throat> You know, obviously there was sadness for the for losing that character. I love that character, Misty. Yeah, Man will always, 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 you know, be in my heart. Um, and that first, like, you know, she was the first black female superhero ever drawn, and I was the first person to, you know, breathe life into her. So, and I take yeah, that like, right. so I will always love that character. Um, but getting to then say, all right, God, if this is not it, then what is it? And then I got Altered Carbon, and I got to go off to Vancouver and play another badass and, and be like, okay, this is cool, and was completely satisfied with that. And then got a phone call to, you know, fly to L.A. on a Saturday. It was Thursday, and I worked all day Friday, and I needed to fly to L.A. on Saturday, and I ended up doing a two-hour-long audition. And got all rise and then the show got picked up and now the show just got picked up for season two and so you know i just recognize i i also recognized that before today if god said you're not going to get a season two then that was what the best thing was going to be and i wasn't going to question it because you know a lot of times in our careers we're always like well why not this what you know i really want that why not and i feel like I've spent so much time asking God why that I've used up my whys. Like I've used up when it comes to my career. Now, you know, there are things in, like why this coronavirus? Why? You know what I mean? There are things yeah. that I will obviously question why with, but with this career thing, it's like in my, easy, my easiest path is to just put my head down and walk. Mm -hmm. And so that was it. I think that was more than three minutes. <laughs> yeah, that was that was uh, that was a black church. I ain't, I ain't gonna be before you long. That's the that's the black folk church. Uh, three minutes. It was all good. People needed to hear that, you yeah. know. And we just thank you for your time and coming on the show and just um, you know, just giving this insight to people that you know are trying to be actors. People, it's hard in this time right now to even give people advice on how to be an actor. Like it's a whole different thing. But we just wanted people to hear your story because you are amazing. And our next guest, Yvette Nicole Brown, is amazing. I and, like her. And um, we just thank you for your Instagram, time. Instagram, we need more time. Yeah, we, we thank do, you guys. We do. Shoot. Oh, God. Yvette, I used up your time. I'm sorry. I love y'all. I'll talk to love you later. Love you guys. Love you too. I love Bye. you. Bye. I love Simone. You're going into time. Okay. So, we're, where you at, Event? There you go. Waiting for Yvette Nicole Brown. <laughs> Uh -oh. There she is. Hi uh -oh. guys. Listen. Hi. Now I gotta give I gotta give you a roses real quick. Maybe you can get out the way. So guys, listen, we have the most amazing, talented individual on the planet, our sister, um, Yvette Nicole Brown. You may have known her as Dina Rose on ABC, The Mayor, Shirley uh Bivens in the BT New Edition story. The, on the R couple, you've seen her as um on the hit show, this uh, community, and she also is a is a voiceover artist, amazing. The Loud House, uh, Lego Star Wars superheroes, the list goes on and on and on. But she is amazing, amazing, and she's representing Cleveland, Ohio, East Cleveland, Ohio, to be exact. Mm -hmm. Writer, producer of amazing movie. Mm -hmm. What was the name of the movie? Always a bridesmaid. Uh -huh. ah, hey, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, hey, yeah. there it is. There it is. Amazing film. Amazing film. Thank you. Event Nicole Brown. Woo! You know what? Y'all could have stayed with Simone for another 57 hours because she blessed my soul. Do you understand? Yeah. Trying to get, my, get my good light on. She was <laughs> let me get Let me get the good light. Uh -huh. um, no, she blessed my soul. I loved her story. I did not know her whole journey, so I was so excited and Y'all could have talked to her for another 30 minutes and we could have rescheduled my situation because that was a blessing to all. Listen, uh, if you all are willing, I'm like, we're going to have you have you both back again for an hour apiece. I'll do it. We'll do that. Do it. Yes. Hi, guys. Hey. Hi. <laughs> I just want to say how I met Miss Yvette Nicole Brown. 
do it. It was back in 2015. A casting director, Tracy Twinkie Bird, actually connected us. And um, Tracy Twinkie was like, hey, I think you should uh, connect with Yvette. And I'm like, me? Really? Okay. You know, you know how I do, Yvette. I know. I don't. I mean, I know why. I know how you do, but I don't know why you would do that with me. But okay, I do know that you do that. You know. Yeah, I don't know. God is working with me. Yeah. Um, connected uh, because we were shooting on the same lot. Yeah. Um, at the time, Yvette came over to my set. I was shooting grandfathered at the time, and you would have thought that this woman has known me for my entire life. It was just like, oh, hey, you're. You're a regular person. Great and lovely and kind. And when I tell you, you have poured into my life in oh. such, like you pour so much that I can't help but cry. Like that's oh. that's what you pour into me. It's like coming out. It's like she's full, she's full. <laughs> and I gotta still keep crying. So you're amazing. And what I love about you, Yvette, is that you will come on set and check on my wife. Even when you're not on set, like you just there, you like, I gotta check on my sis. I, I'm, you know, if you're not there, you got people look, looking out for her and I just, Thank you for that, because we need that. We need people to look out for each other in this industry, especially as Black African-Americans. We don't do that often. That's and um, I heard a story about you from a casting director, and I she didn't say her, her, her the name, but I knew the story because of what she said afterwards. I knew it was about you, and I think I mentioned it to you, but I just want people to tell you to briefly tell your story of how you came from singing in the choir in um, Cleveland to laying the role of Shirley Bennett on the community. Oh, well, there's a lot in between, like a stage play and commercials and a whole bunch of stuff between Shirley. Drake and Josh was before Shirley. Um, I had a really bad pilot season <clears throat> the year that they cast Community. Um, I mean, like a bad pilot season where we already, as Black people, don't get a lot of auditions, but it was the kind of pilot season where even with every audition I got, if I got close, it always went to somebody else. So I got like almost there, like three times in one pilot season, which that many at-bats for a Black person in a pilot is already miraculous. But to not get them, I was broken. And so I had decided that my pilot season was done. I was like, I'm done with this one. I'm not even <laughs> going to cry anymore. And so I, the the call came in from my agent about an audition for a show called Community. And um, I had already decided I had taken my ball and going home. So I didn't read the sides. I didn't read the script. I went to bed and set an alarm to wake up at nine o'clock and call and pass. I'm like, when I wake up, I'm gonna call my agent when they're in and I'm gonna pass on this audition, N unread. So I got up at nine, I'm about to call my agent. I'm like, well, I should at least read the script to see what it is I'm passing on. And then I read it and it was hilarious. And I was like, oh no, because then I only had like three or four hours to figure out who this woman was and to go to this audition. And um, <clears throat> so I scrambled and I got there and I always tell the story about Terry, um, Terry J. Vaughn because she is a guardian. I have so many guardian angels in this industry of other actors that are just kind. You know, one of them is um, Sherry Shepard. When I did Girlfriends, first thing I ever did, I'd never done a table read. I'd never been on set. I didn't know anything. And Sherry and I went to the same thing. I was like, Sherry, I, I got to go in tomorrow. I don't know what to do. She broke down everything that I would um, encounter on the set of Girlfriends so that I didn't walk in green. So she's one guardian angel. But for a uh, community, I got to the parking lot where we were all gathering. And the reason we were gathering in the parking lot is because Dan Harmon had decided to see every black woman that had ever been black in America. When I tell you, everybody from eight to 80 was auditioning for sure. <laughs> every, everybody was there. And most of them had had shows. And these were, this was like heavyweight people. And Terry J. Vaughn was one of them. And the line to even go in was so long. And I was like, Terry, I don't know if I should stay. Should I stay to do this? Like, y'all are you. here. Why would they even consider me if you here? Like, this is a waste of time. And Terry J. Vaughn said, you're going to go in there, and you're going you gonna to go in, you're going to whatever, and you're going to use whatever frustration you got, because Shirley's frustrated half the time in this pilot. You're going to use that frustration, whatever. So that's what Terry J. Vaughn said. Now, I tell you, I never say the name of the person at this, but there was somebody else that was there. And when I got into the second, into the actual room, off the parking lot, into the room, waiting in the next holding area, there was another actress there. And I said to her, still in doubt, do you think, you know, we, gosh, it's, we're still here. It's been like two hours. We stay. And she was like, girl, I think you should go. She was staying. But she said she thought I should go. Mm. I was like, the devil is a lie. And Terry J. Vaughn is telling the truth. I'm going to stay up in here. 
And, you know, it worked out where I got it. But it just, it was a lesson to me that it's kind of like what Simone was saying. Um, you, you don't know what God wants at any given time. And you think that something is over. You think that it's not worth it. You think that there's no chance. And God is like, can you just try me? How about you try me? Just go on in and say these lines right quick and see if maybe I have a blessing for you. Because every good thing that we get from God, so why are we trying to micro? what he's trying to do right so mm -hmm. and he'll send someone he sends signposts you know i feel like terry was placed on that parking lot at that moment she could have already auditioned and been gone but she was there for that moment for me yeah and there's never a time that i've seen her that i have not given her flowers there's never been a time that someone asked me about this story that i have not given her her flowers she's an amazing wonderful kind caring woman and you know yeah i love that Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, it's you know it's always interesting when you you interview your friends and your family. It's, you know we're on a different side of it, so um, I, I just wanted to just say um, your importance as an African American woman in this business. How do you feel like it is important for you to now go from you know just being the actors to now writing and producing your own projects like always a bride mates which i know that you know you wrote several years ago yeah. um what gave you the willpower to say you know what now is the time to to write now is the time to get this out and let me find somebody that i connect with on a level to produce this into reality well i feel like as as black people in life but especially in this business we ain't gonna never go we are never gonna rise until we are the gatekeeper, right? There's only so much we can do expecting someone else to give us a chance. That's what I love about the, um, the Black Rebirth Collective. You guys are creating a space for people to become creators. You're creating a space for people to um, reconnect with the thing that made them be in the industry in the first place. And that, that's going to bear fruit for years and years to come. And you know, I know the building phase is difficult, but the tree that, you're, that you, you planted the seed, the tree, the oak tree that's going to come is going to be amazing. But there comes a time, well, for me, I've reached a certain age and I'm tired, y'all. I don't want to put on the Spanx. I don't want to, I don't want to do the makeup. I don't, I want to, I want to find some talented black people and provide opportunities for them to shine. And I know that that's going to be the next thing that I move into because it's so rewarding. I think people think that the only reward in this business is to be out front. And I think the great reward is in the back. I think the greater reward is being the steps for someone. The greater reward is being a Trojan horse that provides opportunities for people. And I hope, I pray that God, I can shift into that next phase. And, you know, it's important for me when, as a part of this industry, I always want to be the welcome mat, the welcome mat for people, or the welcome, the welcome for people. Mm -hmm. So every time a new actress comes in, I, I, my heart is for young um, black actresses. Whenever they come in the business, I find them. Where they are, if I'm on, if I'm at a party, if I'm, at, if I'm on set, I will find them and introduce myself to them and let give them my number and say, if there's anything you need, I am here for you because, you know, the the generation or the group of actresses right before me, I think, still bought into the lie that there wasn't enough. So when I came in, it wasn't as welcoming as it could have been, and I don't, and I know that feeling of just wanting to perform and 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 use your gift and then. The, the people that are already in going, we don't want you. You know, you might take my job. And I just think that's such a lie. Like, what's yours is yours. So I want the babies and the younger people coming in to realize that there's enough to go around. And your greatest, like Simone even said this, your greatest friendships will come from the people you're sitting with in that room waiting to go in. And you guys together can become a fierce tribe that um, creates opportunities for each other. You know what I mean? It's just better together. You know what I mean? So I'm trying to foster that environment. I fostered that environment with my boys there. You know, I sat them all down when we got the, when we got on the show, and I said, "Listen, Brandon is the star, but that doesn't mean that the rest of you are not stars. He's the one out front, but also Brandon, it's your job to make sure that when they're trying to push you out front, they can grab the boys and go together. You mm -hmm. guys can do this entire industry, your entire careers. You can do." walking hand in hand, supporting and encouraging each other. And don't let anybody break the bond because there's always here. But you know, so-and-so show what's funny in that scene. Don't, don't let it in. Don't listen to it. Don't allow it to take root. Realize that 
God gives us tribes for a reason. You know what I mean? We're supposed mm -hmm. to walk through this together. It is dangerous and lonely in entertainment by yourself. You can think you're special and you you you're the only star if you want to. Mm -hmm. you're the only sad road. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So do it together. Yeah. Absolutely. And your heart. Oh, Yvette, your heart is just so golden. It is oh. so golden. Yvette hosted uh, Black Rebirths Collective's first annual fundraiser. And again, when I tell you that, so I told Kim, I said, I low-key want to have Yvette as the host. And Kim was like, I love it. Um, you know how Kim is. I don't yeah. And she was like, so who's going to reach out? And I was like, I don't know who's going to reach out. So we're both like, you know, no. And so then... I think, did Kim reach out to you or did I reach out to you? One of us I, reached out. No, no, no. I think I saw y'all talking about it and I reached out. You reached out. <laughs> saying, y'all doing something and you ain't calling nobody. I, <laughs> so, I yes. I can't re be reborn. You can't rebirth something in me. <laughs> so then I think I text Kim like, did you see what Yvette said? Like, this is what Yvette said. <laughs> So then we hopped on a call and we were just talking. And then, you know, that was like, you know, I would love to play any kind of role. I'm here to support you, um, you know, behind the scenes, whatever it is you all need me to do. And Kim was like, great, wonderful. So we were wondering if you would host our first April <laughs> fundraiser. You were like, but that's not, that's not what I said. <laughs> but yes, I will do it whatever you need. And that is just who you are and I've seen like the comments and they're like yes that's who we've is I go on your live and you you're like talking to I don't want to call them fans you know just people you know you're just talking to them and they're always when I've never seen a face that picks up that's not like this you know because <laughs> that you, you they come on and they're like I'm talking to her <laughs> you know and it's it's just it's so beautiful it's so beautiful okay 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 yeah. Always a bridesmaid. Where yes. did that come from? You know, I wrote it when uh, 20 years ago. Um, I wrote it because we didn't have a black romantic comedy at the time that was PG-13. And mm -hmm. I love a film called While You Were Sleepy with, Sleeping with Sandra Bullock. And I wanted to create our version of that. But I wasn't creating it to be a movie. I, I didn't have dream. I don't, I'm not ambitious, first of all. You guys should know that. I don't have, like, I'm going to take over the world. I don't think like that. I wanted to write the script so that I could read the script whenever I wanted to see the movie in my mind. Mm. My mind is very descriptive. So I'm like, I'm going to write this perfect love story with these two beautiful black people. And then whenever I want to see it, I'm just going to get my script out and read it. So I wrote it, put it on the shelf, and didn't think about it for about uh, 12 years. And then I was out to lunch with my friend, Nakaya Indy Brown, who's um, partners with Trey Haley, who directed Always a Bridesmaid. They have a company called Tridestin, which does family business on BT, Carl Weber's family business, and a movie called Influence, and a whole bunch of other movies. And she just happened to say it during the, the lunch. Um, Do you write? Like, out of nowhere. And I was like, what well, girl, I used to. Like, I got a script. And she was like, can I read it? I was like, I don't care. So I gave it to her. She read it. She wanted to option it. This was eight years, eight or nine years ago. And so she was trying to get it placed and made for eight or nine years. And I realized when they got a three picture deal with BT and Always a Bridesmaid was one of the films chosen, I realized that it took eight years, eight or nine years, because it was for that group of actors. And those babies were, you know, still in high school. Babies. <laughs> they were in high school and college when we first mm -hmm. started. And they had to grow up and get ready to play all of those amazing characters. Some of them, this was the first thing they ever did. They weren't even actors when if the movie had been made eight years, we would not have had the cast that we had. So mm. I, I believe the timing of it was perfect. Um, the fact that it released on, on Netflix during the pandemic, where more people have been able to see it than would have ever been able to see it had it been made years ago, you know, it's or 20 years ago. So um, I see God's hand in it. I want to say something else. I know we're running out of time, but I want to say something to everybody about followers and um, um fandom and, and whatever. I feel like we're too focused on who's watching us mm -hmm. and the quantity of people that are watching us. And this idea that even with like Instagram Live and all this stuff we're doing, we're so focused on who's watching me? We have enough people. What's 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 about and I got I had a, a a feeling from God yesterday that and I say this all the time, but this was it was dialed into the follower situation. We are supposed to plant the seed and we have to allow God to control, to have something to do with the harvest. The harvest is his. 
The harvest mm -hmm. is not ours. And so if you do a live, if you guys are building something here, if you do a live and it's five people, you can trust and believe as, as children of God that the five people that were supposed to hear what you had to say on that given day will be in that room. Mm -hmm. Don't worry about a million. Don't worry about 100,000. Within those five could be the person that's going to go on to do something that is going to change the whole world. You may never know. But if God puts it on your heart to say something or share something or do something or write something, just do it. Mm -hmm. And let, the, let society's idea of what success is be their mess. That's none of your business. That's none of your business. If you go on live, go on live and God tells you to, bring the people on board that you're supposed to bring on board. And the rest of the rest. Hey, Mom. Hey, Mama. Hey, Mama. Hey, Mama. I'm just, I'm standing up because you're preaching a word. So no, that's what true. you, yeah. That's the thing too. The Bible also says despise not small beginnings, right? Yes. So everything that you're building, like even if you look at somebody like uh, D-Nice, those first DJ sets were like a thousand people. Hello. It might even been smaller than that. He went up to like 300,000, whatever it is. But it doesn't matter is my point. Mm -hmm. It grew when it was supposed to grow. It grew for the purpose that it was supposed to grow. It did what it was supposed to do. He's now using that to get people to start voting and whatever. And if he had done that first live and saw 500 people and be like, well, what am I doing this for? <laughs> yeah. Don't concern yourself with the harvest, everybody. Don't concern yourself with the harvest. Plant the seed. Plant the seed. And show up for other people. Amen. Show up for other people. I want to I wanted definitely get this question in because I think it's important, even in times where you're not in front of the camera, you do a lot of voiceover. Can you briefly speak about what got you in the voiceovers and like how is that like the way that sometimes you, if you're doing that, you don't have to necessarily depend on, like I said, being an actor or you should just playing don't. in the back. <laughs> you don't. Uh, voiceovers, first of all, are very lucrative. Uh, the time that you, the time it takes to do them is like maybe anywhere from 10 minutes to an hour. The money's the same whether you're there 10 minutes or an hour. Um, you don't have to dress up. You don't have to makeup on, which I love. You just go up in there. And I think the, there's a mystique about it. Like it's so difficult and so hard because those that are in there making that money don't want nobody else to get up in there. I'm going to tell you, there's no mystique to it. You don't have to have a thousand voices. You don't have to be this prolific voiceover person. There's some that can do that. Most people are just using their own voice. They're just pitching it up, pitching it down. It's that simple. And the only thing that I say is a prerequisite is you have to be able to act. It is acting. And it's a different type of acting because they can't see you. So everything that you're feeling has to be put in your voice. And that's a skill. But it's like riding a bike. Once you click into it, it never leaves you. So, yeah. So I think it's, I think it's great. I got in just because my, I was doing community and my agent at the time knew someone at my voice, my, my now voiceover <laughs> agent. They were like, you know, does he better have an agent? And my, my agent, my actual agent they were like, well, can we hit pocket her? I was like, yeah, great. God, I didn't yeah. plan God. And that's the same for all of us. If we just yield and do what he tells us to do, it's going to be all right. It's going to yeah. be all right. Everybody. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. We ought to definitely bring y'all back. This I know. This is not enough time. I had a great time. You know, I, was looking, I took a nap before this. <laughs> I was like, I got to be ready for, for Kelly and Melvin. Simone, I'm following Simone. I got to have something to say. So I took a little nap. Well, you look refreshed and beautiful, yeah, as it's always. It's like I've, I've never seen you not. It's 57 <laughs> lights on me. I have been in the sun. Bring in the sun. Lights, lights. Like Simone was saying, like, all of the stuff that they had to do, yeah. You know, so I saw someone, you know, uh, commented like it gives you a greater appreciation. You know, yeah. I pray that when yeah. we do get to go back, there is a, a greater appreciation yeah. for those of us who've not been appreciative because some of us have been. We, I listen, crew is life. H Hello, everything. Hello, we about to everything. cut us off. They about to cut us off. I know every time. Say goodbye for they do it though. Thank you so much, Steve. Nicole Brown. We love you too, sis. Thank see you love to your father. I see you cut his hair. Um well, I'm not there yet. Maybe, you know. I tell you he won't he won't let me cut his hair. Let Where do it. Let him do it. You got we're gonna be here for a while. You got time to grow it out. You understand what I'm saying? All right, if I look like George Jefferson, I'm gonna blame you. Okay, do it. <laughs> All right, bye. I love, love you. you. Bye. I love you guys. Bye. Bye. bye.
All right, guys, we have 20 seconds left. Thank you all so much for tuning in today. We had an amazing time with Simone Mystic and Yvette Nicole Brown. And if they will allow us, we're going to have them back again. Yes. All right. Love you guys. Bye. He going to cut it off. <laughs>